Amen. So this is uh, Trials and Travels, or Travels and Trials, uh, whichever way you want to say it. And that, uh, that chapter 20 has quite a bit about places. It's interesting. Uh, you know, in Acts chapter 20, it seems that Luke joins the team uh, because you have the, you know, the us ver, uh, pronouns that are there. Instead of uh, Paul talking, it's we or us. And so he adds quite a bit of narrative as to places and adds details that you don't find uh, in, in other parts of the book of Acts. But, uh, so we begin in verse 1, when the uproar had ended. What's the uproar we're talking about there? Or that they are talking about there? Uh, different uproar. Uh, that was, uh, there was an uproar on the day of Pentecost. But Paul tried to do it. Yeah, it's Acts chapter 19, so it's Paul in Ephesus, you know, when everybody was yelling, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, a lot of the people were in there yelling, they didn't even know what they were yelling about. Um, the local man on the street did, you know, did the interviews, people go, we don't know why we're here, we just heard there was a demonstration, you know, we thought we'd show up, not much new under the sun, is there? But anyway, so there was quite an uproar, and uh, friends of Paul told him that, you know, he should not go in there, but... Anyway, when the uproar ended, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, said goodbye, and set out for Macedonia. He traveled through that area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and finally arrived in Greece, where he stayed three months. Because the Jews made a plot against him, just as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopater, son of Pyrrhus from Berea, Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius of Derby, Timothy also, and Tychicus and Trophimus from the province of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us at Troas. But we sailed from Philippi after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And five days later, Joined the others at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Well, for our purposes here, uh, you know, we're talking about places. What you discover is, especially in this chapter, how active a person Paul was. I mean, he was a guy on the go. Uh, you also get a feeling for the spiritual motivation that he had, and uh, it gives us a good measure. But, uh, so he is over on the right-hand side, about middle way on the map, is Ephesus. So he is there in Ephesus, and when he says goodbye to them, he heads for Macedonia. You see that at the top of the map? And then it says, after that, we have finally arrived in Greece. Uh, I mean, Thessalonica and Philippi would be in Greece now, but uh, Greece then would have been the lower part of the peninsula there, and the Peloponnese and those areas, Athens, Corinth, places like that. So he goes down to that area, and then he's getting ready to sail for Syria, it says. This map uh, gives you a picture of that. This is from the time period, let's call it 1000 BC, right until the Babylonian conquest. But you see that Syria was somewhat near where we uh, are today. Syria today is a little further north, more north and not quite as far south there. But, uh, and Phoenicia is relatively, uh, now that would be a modern le country of Lebanon, encompasses what would have been Phoenicia back in the day. But anyway, that's where Paul is going to head out a little bit later on. So he is, uh, he's on a travel, uh, and, he's, and he's gonna cover a lot of territory here. What I find interesting is that this is after the Acts 15 Council. The Acts 15 Council was where it was decided within Christianity that the law was not a pathway to salvation. That keeping the law and the, and the feasts of the law and all of those sorts of things were not part of the new system going forward. But even so, here we are in Acts chapter 20, and Paul is making reference to the Feast of Unleavened Bread uh, as uh, we sailed from Philippi after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So 
What major biblical holiday or event, I guess, day is connected to the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Who knows the answer to that question? Passover. Passover, exactly. So Passover, you have a Passover, then you have the Feast of First Fruits, which is Easter, going back to the first time of Christ and his death and resurrection. And, and this, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a seven-day event that, that encompasses Passover, Feast of First Fruits, so it's the overarching uh, event there. But it's still a reference point. Now, Paul is in uh, Philippi when, uh, the, for Passover, and not in Jerusalem, so he clearly is not following the law to uh, get to Jerusalem and be one of the three times that, you know, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Uh, so he's not following the law that way, but it's still a reference point. And in this chapter, he's also going to make reference to Pentecost, uh, where he wants to be in Jerusalem for Pentecost. And so that's interesting to be five chapters after the date when the law is no longer required, and Paul is still referencing the calendar by the mandatory biblical feasts. So people that are into those kind of details will appreciate all of that. All right, so we come to um, uh, the, the first indication of Sunday worship. On the first day of the week, which is Sunday, we came together to break bread. And that terminology, the first day of the week and the breaking of bread, we're going to get into a little bit later, uh, is an indication of the Lord's Day or Sunday and communion. So breaking bread is not just eating, but it had particular meaning. It is the Holy Communion or the Eucharist or uh, the Lord's Supper. All of those would be part of it. So first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Now, why is that significant? Because if you're in an upstairs room and there's many lamps and lots of people, oxygen gets thin, um, presumably. And that's the gracious way of describing what's going to happen next. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. So here you have the terminology, break bread, associated initially with Passover, but now it is the remembrance of the body and blood of the Lord, as we do in Holy Communion. And here it's on the first Sunday of the month, but it could be more often or less often than that. Uh, the service, uh, go, you start, it's an evening service, and it goes till midnight. And, uh, and then the guy, you know, you can imagine, you know, midnight. And he's a young person, so they're not as good as staying awake. And he falls out of the window and uh, dies. Uh, you know, when you get older, you that are younger don't have any appreciation for what I just said. But there's this funny line in the Bible that says, you know, when you get older, your hearing goes bad. You can't hear, but you wake up at the sound of a bird. So you can't hear but the slightest sound makes you come awake. And every older person in the room knows exactly what I'm talking about here, because uh, that is what happens. But anyway, uh, he talks till midnight, the guy falls out, uh, and Paul goes down and stretches out on the person. What does that remind us of? It reminds us of when Elijah did the same thing, and Elisha. And so uh, they did that, Paul did the same thing. It puts Paul in a category with the really the greatest people of the Old Testament, which would be Moses and Elijah. And he, uh, he is placed into that category by this act, which, I mean, it, it was notable. Luke, the physician, took note of it. But it's pretty remarkable 
uh, that a guy who falls from a third story, you know, is, uh, is dead, and, um, and yet he's revived. And so, and that's, you know, there in verse 12, the people, the people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. That he didn't take him home dead, they took him home alive. And so that was quite a miracle, and, and so that's important. So uh, Paul talks all night long. Um, it's going to be his last chance to be with them for a while, maybe forever. And, uh, and he leaves in the morning. Now, so he talks all night long. And come daybreak, everybody has to get ready to go to work. And Paul heads off for the next town, which is pretty amazing. I, I don't know if you've ever uh, been that motivated. I was only that motivated once. I used to, when I was in college, I, 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 in the summertime, I sometimes worked the night shift. I worked in a factory. And uh, so one time, I worked in the factory all night long. And uh, got off work at 7 o'clock in the morning, got in my car and drove to California uh, because there was a cute girl at a camp down there. Uh, and I wanted to ask her to marry me. And she said yes. And so I was down there for the weekend. And then uh, Sunday, and I had arranged my schedule so that uh, after church and everything on Sunday, in fact, through Sunday night, I was able to get in my car and drive all the way back home. Uh, so that I could be at work at 11 o'clock on Sunday night uh, to work the night shift uh, that night. So I basically, I burned it on both ends. But, you know, when you're highly motivated by love, you can do these things. Uh, and the Apostle Paul was clearly highly motivated by love uh, because he talks all night and then walks all day and, uh, and carries on the work of the ministry. That's a pretty uh, exceptional human being, it seems to me. Um, so he is, um, but the fact that this is on the first day of the week, uh, that's important. I don't think it's an accident uh, that Luke tells us this. Uh, it's the first day of the week, uh, and they're breaking bread. That is, they're doing the things that are related to Sunday worship, or to worship in a Christian setting, and that is Holy Communion. Um, the Apostle John in the Revelation um, simply says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day and offers no further explanation. So by the end of the first century, everyone would have known that the Lord's Day, what day that is, that Sunday, and he is in the Spirit. He's expecting that they're going to read the Revelation aloud in the church and um, at Ephesus and other places. And so for them to be in church on a Sunday and to know that John was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, uh, but by then uh, it was an established transition already. That from Sabbath to Sunday takes place in the first century and is so well established that by the end of the first century, you don't even need to, to say that detail as you do here in the middle part of the first century, uh, where Luke gives it to us. So the transition has gotten made. Uh, the transition from Sabbath to Sunday, some people say, oh, no, it's a fourth century thing. No, no, it's a first century thing. Uh, and it was well established uh, by that tack. Sorry about that. Let me. Sorry. Um, but anyway, uh, where was I? No one knows. Um, I, I was trying to find my phone is where I was. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a first century uh, established event. And, and why do we choose to worship on Sunday? It's not the Sabbath day, you know. Uh, why do we worship on Sunday? Because of the resurrection. Exactly. Um, and you, I, some of the church fathers talk about that transition, and they actually did have, um, you know, there was dignity attached to the Sabbath, and one of the church fathers, I can't remember which one it is right now that I'm thinking of, he said, we use the Sabbath as a preparation for the Lord's Day. So it was really, you had two spiritual days, the Sabbath, the day of preparation, uh, the Lord's Day, a day recognizing the resurrection of Christ. The resurrection was everything. Uh, in the early church. In fact, when you read the sermons of the book of Acts, uh, the, 
the most common subject of the sermons is the resurrection. It was the big deal uh, in the early church. Uh, there, I have a paragraph in here about the content of services. We really don't have a lot of information in the church fathers or anywhere else about what they actually did in the services. It's amazing how little there actually is on that subject. I mean, you have some, you have the prayers over communion uh, in some of the, like the liturgy of St. James, the brother of the Lord, uh, from very early. But a lot of, there's not a lot of information. But Pliny the Younger, a Latin author serving as Roman council under Emperor Trajan, wrote a letter to the emperor in AD 112. He said that in Bithynia, the people known as Christians were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light, when they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ as to a God and bound themselves by a solemn oath not to any, wick, not to any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, or adultery, never to falsify their word, nor deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up, after which it was their custom to separate and then reassemble to partake of food, but food of an ordinary and innocent kind. So that description is they meet before sunrise uh, on the Lord's Day because people have to work. And so they meet very, very early in the morning. And then they basically go to work, and then they reassemble at a later time. That is, Sunday evening, after work, they get back together again. They have a common meal together. Uh, and, and he says here, of an ordinary kind, as opposed to the Lord's Supper or something like that. But it may have been that as well. Um, and that, this is probably one of the best uh, statements in, in very ancient times that we have as to the content of a Christian service um, in the year uh, 112 A.D. Um, the other thing, the other notable thing about this passage is, of course, Eutychus. He has been the subject of considerable derision over the years. Uh, many people have slept in church. But of all the people who slept in church, Eutychus would be the greatest one. Uh, I mean, he would be, I mean, he's in the Bible for having slept in church. There's been, you know, by the way, there's been research done on this subject. And they have found that if you took all the people who have slept in church at one time or another and laid them end to end, they would be far more comfortable. Uh, that's the research that's been found. Uh, but anyway... So this is uh, quite impressive. Okay, um, so the next passage here, um, beginning with verse 13, we went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Asos, where we were going to take Paul aboard. Where had they been? What, in what city did Eutychus fall from the uh, window? Yes, that's why we do Bible places. Uh, uh, if this was a trivia test, you would all lose. Troas. Um, what else happened to Troas in Acts chapter 16, for example? It's the Macedonian call. Paul is there when he receives the Macedonian call, come over and help us. So that's when Christianity leaves Asia uh, or departs from Asia and first arrives in Europe. And now it's going the other direction. Uh, Paul comes from Europe to Troas, does his preaching and teaching that we just read about, and now he's going to head down the coast. Uh, let me just read through the paragraph, and then I'll walk you through some of the places. We wanted, went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Asos, where we were going to take Paul aboard. He had made this arrangement because he was going there on foot. When he met us at Asos, we took him aboard and went on to Mytilene. The next day we set sail from there and arrived off Chios. The day after that we crossed over to Samos and on the following day arrived at Miletus. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. So again, that's the second reference to uh, a biblical event, a biblical day, based on um, this passage. Now let me just show you a few pictures. 
Um, I took this picture. I love to get the uh, kind of the background. But this is Troas. If you were to go there today, um, they have uh, uncovered, you know, the foundations of buildings and such like that. This is the old Roman road that passes through uh, Troas. You can see where they've excavated it there, the good pavement, the curb. I mean, construction methods weren't so different in all of that. And this is the notable arch that is in Troas. Uh, I, I think that this picture I took at uh, Troas. Um, and, um, but I can't prove that, but I believe that's where that was. And uh, they all set sail. Paul set sail from there when he went to Europe for the first time. And the group that's being mentioned in the scripture here is at Troas. And they're going to go down to Asos by ship. And Paul, he says, you guys go by ship. I'm going to go inland. And so he walks the distance. In my notes, my first set of notes that I printed, I said 150 miles. And I got to looking at that and realized that was completely wrong. So in the later set of notes, it's 20 miles. Um, but anyway, uh, and so let me just show you a little bit about the overland route that Paul would have taken. Uh, this bridge, it's a very ancient bridge. There's, you notice the unusual shape of it, how it comes to kind of a point. And from this angle, you can see it even more dramatically. There's a similar bridge to this at Palmyra uh, in, in Syria, where they've you know, been a lot of fighting and carrying on. But this is a classic uh, Roman bridge. But isn't that a weird thing? I mean, if you were taking a car, I mean, motorcyclists would love that. Uh, that'd be an awesome jump right there, making sure you hit the right spot and to make sure there wasn't a cart coming up the other side. Uh, but anyway, it's, it is an interesting thing. So Paul would have walked over land, over the hill and dale, and it's quite a steep terrain, as you can see. When you get to Asos, this is what you find. Uh, this is the road. And, uh, you know, from the, the beach... From the coast up to Asos, it's on quite a high hill, as you'll see in just a moment. But they have excavated the Roman road that comes up there. So you can see the actual road that Paul would surely have walked on. But, you know, this is the main road that goes up to the, um, up to the upper part of the city. Uh, this is Linda and the guy that helped drove us around when I was there in uh, uh, Turkey on this particular trip. Um, just my wife and I, and, and Benner Okel, who was our driver. But anyway, we head up the hill. It was interesting because we come around a bend, and here's this lady sitting there. Uh, I mean, nobody is there. Well, first of all, it's February, you know, so it's cold and miserable. And this lady, there's just a handful of people live in the city, and she's out there hoping that, you know, this tourist is going to buy something, but of course, in that particular case, we didn't. Although afterwards, it was so cold, we went down, there was a little cafe, kind of like, and we went into this room just to sit around the fire and uh, drink the tea and, uh, and warm up a little bit. But anyway, it was, uh, so you hike up through what is left of ASOS today. And as you're approaching it, of course, you can see up on the hill, that's the, the top of the city. Um, I was kept my eye on this particular bull. I, th I don't know if he was a bull or whatever he was, but anyway, he had horns, and that made me think that I wanted to keep an eye on him. And um, but anyway, got past him, and uh, and got up on top the hill. So here's Linda looking out over the valley. Uh, this particular picture I like because uh, we're sitting up at the. Um, on top of the city, because a lot of these ancient cities, you know, were built on the hilltops. But you can see where the coast is. And so the Roman road, the ship would have come in by sea uh, from Troas, you know, up the coast a very short distance. Paul comes over the hills, and, uh, and the ship, would have, they would have walked up the hill and uh, met Paul up on top. But here gives you another picture. There's, I forget the temple that was, uh, who that was to Athena or somebody like that. But anyway, these are the remains of the temple that was up on top of the, the city of Aso. So Paul goes there, don't know why, but he clearly wanted to make some contacts along the way. He may have been along that way a time or two before. So let me just walk you through um, 
kind of the journey that, well, he starts out in Ephesus. We pointed that out. Uh, then we next find him up there at Philippi. And uh, he's going to, from Philippi, Neapolis is the seaport um, of Philippi. And so from there, he sails over to Troas, retracing his steps that he took in Acts chapter 16, except that he doesn't stop at Samothrace, um, that little island, but he keeps on going down to Troas. And then from Troas, he goes inland to Asos. Uh, the other folks went around, and they went by sea, but he goes to Asos. And then from there, uh, he says they go to Mytilene uh, in the next verse there. And then they uh, sail past uh, Chios or whatever that city is. And by the way, when you take Aegean cruises today, which is a wonderful uh, trip to take by cruise boat, uh, you go past these islands and, you know, they, they sail along uh, through the coast there and uh, and usually the cruise boats will stop at Ephesus as the one Turkish stop uh, sailing out of Athens. And uh, so you sail through these islands and it's kind of fun to do that. When, I, uh, uh, when I've, taken, I've taken that cruise uh, a couple, few times, I can't remember how many times, but I've always been able to talk the captain into letting me give lectures on the boat. And, um, and so I tell him, you know, I'm some expert on something. And so... Uh, and, and I, I show my book or something. And so they, uh, they've given me opportunity, and they'll put it on the ship calendar, the whole thing, you know. And so I'll go into the big con meeting room, you know, and you'll have several hundred people that'll show up. I mean, what else are they going to do, right? So they're sailing like to Ephesus, for example. I'm thinking about that. And I, so I give a lecture on Ephesus to prepare them for it. And uh, it's, a, it's a decent lecture, but I always work the gospel in. Because, you know, I, you know, the part of this is the biblical significance. And, uh, and so I will uh, reference the Bible and the plan of salvation. And, you know, in a way that fits with the lecture, uh, that they don't think they're being preached at too terrible much. But they are getting preached at. And so, uh, you know, a couple of times the captain has taken me into the, you know, the ship's, the captain's quarter up there where you run the ship, and that's always kind of fun. Occasionally, they've given me extra dessert in the dining room, and that's how I get paid other than from the Lord. But anyway, and, um, and I've done that. At a, I, I did that when we were going into Istanbul. I, I gave a lecture going into Istanbul on the ships and different things. It's been, uh, I, I've kind of used it to, to do a little evangelizing, and I've enjoyed it. Uh, well, Samos, so he talks about sailing by that island. They stop at Miletus. Uh, we'll show some pictures of Miletus. And you will notice where Miletus is in relation to Ephesus. So it's about 30 miles from Miletus to Ephesus. And what we're going to study here in a little moment is that um, uh, Paul does not stop in Ephesus, where he is pastored, because he's in a hurry. And he knows if he goes to Ephesus, he's going to get cornered by a bunch of people. He's going to have to go to lunch at 27 people's houses. And uh, he wants to get on going. And so he goes to Miletus and sends word to Ephesus for the elders to come meet him at, at Miletus. But they got a well, you know, 30 mile walk. But I'll show you the valleys and the route they would have gone. <clears throat> and so Paul gives one of his great messages to the shepherds of uh, Ephesus in that little town, or not, not a little town, the town of Miletus. And uh, the message that he gives, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And he goes like that. He says, for I know this after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. And that's the message that he gives to the elders. And, we, and we'll go into a little more detail in just a moment. Uh, then from there, they go down to uh, Mytilene. Okay, well... I think that's actually part of the next uh, part. But, okay, I'll, I'll show you a few more pictures here. Uh, the island of Chios, this is one of the harbor areas. There's such great beaches and stuff like that. Uh, 
This is the coastline of the island of Samos uh, that you can see by ship. Oh, yeah, here's the picture I was re referencing. Uh, so uh, Miletus is where the red uh, dot is there. But, and the green, obviously, is um, the valleys, and the brown are the hills. And so if you uh, are going from Ephesus, you would uh, walk over to Magnesia, which is a place you can still visit today. Some wonderful ruins in all these places. But, um, and then go on down to um, Miletus there. They're going to follow uh, the, the river called Meander. You know, when you say you meander, uh, it comes from this river because it does meander through the valley. But if it meanders, what does that tell you about the valley? It's relatively flat. Uh, it's not steep. And so... And that would also be why they can walk rather easily, even though it's 30 miles, it's a reasonable walk because it's through the valleys. And so they just go up to Magnesia and cut on down to Miletus, and it's a, it's a reasonable hike. And then I told you also, well, look, look up from uh, Miletus, look up the valley. Magnesia is there. Aphrodisius, there's some fantastic statuary and stuff there. But then you keep on going. There's Laodicea and Colossae. Uh, you turn left, there's Philadelphia and Sardis and Thyatira. All of those are kind of connected by roads and, and river valleys and such like that. And so it tells you a lot about why they went certain places. I mean, they're following the natural roads. They're following the natural terrain, and, uh, and which is why they, they go from place to place. Uh, the last time I was in Miletus, again, it was in winter, and uh, I mean, that's the city down there, but you notice that, that and that's standing water because it was doing some serious raining that day and had been for a while. It was actually fairly miserable, as it turns out, but it's, uh, it's certainly memorable. Uh, this picture I actually grabbed off the internet, but, um, but that's the Roman theater at Miletus. So it tells you, judging by the size of it, because the Roman theaters, uh, I, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, another trivia question. If the Roman theater has 10,000 people seats, how many people live in the city? 100,000. Uh, they built the theaters to be one tenth the size of the city, um, and so so that so the 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 theater in Ephesus has twenty five thousand seats. So how many people is estimated to live in Ephesus? Two hundred and fifty thousand, exactly, uh, about a quarter of which were Jewish. Um, this picture I also grabbed off the internet. Everything looks better when the sky is clear. But anyway, those are, this is all Miletus, and this is where uh, the next uh, series of events take place. So um, Paul says that he wants to skip Ephesus because he's in a hurry to get to Jerusalem for Pentecost. Uh, it's interesting because in 1 Corinthians 16, he said, I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost. Because a great door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. So here, one case, he says, I'm going to skip Ephesus so I can be in Jerusalem for Pentecost. And the only other reference like this in the New Testament, Paul says, I want to stay at Ephesus until, uh, because, uh, for Pentecost because there's a great door of opportunity. And one of the interesting ways to read the book of Ephesus is to, I'm trying to think of the book that has it in it. It's an obscure book, and I had to get it specially printed. It cost me 75 bucks. But, um, but anyway, he, in that book, he traces out that uh, the, the outline of the book of Ephesus follows certain patterns related to the celebration of Pentecost in Judaism. That's the thesis of his book. He's some professor somewhere, and um, they are interested in that kind of thing. But I thought it was interesting based on the fact that Paul said, I want to be in Ephesus for Pentecost. And then he writes the Ephesian letter following certain outlines and making certain references. You know, like referring to the gifts of the Spirit uh, using the same language that would be used for the Levites. Because the Levites were, were the gift 
uh, to the temple as the gifts of the Spirit are gifts to the church. And there's parallel ideas that uh, Paul draws in that passage. So anyway, um, he uh, meets with the uh, Ephesian elders there. Let me read verse 17. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So um, let's say a word about governance, first of all. This story about the Ephesian elders has shaped a great deal of Protestant polity. Uh, so there are many churches that are elder-run. And they get that idea from this passage, that the Ephesian church had a plurality of elders. And therefore, churches today should have a plurality of elders. In some churches, the pastor is referred to as the teaching elder and may or may not have uh, more authority than any of the other elders. And, you know, we have many churches in this community that would operate like that. Uh, I mean, that would be very much a Presbyterian model. But many Baptist churches operate that way as well. It's not an uncommon model where you have mul multiple elders. I mean, we have multiple elders here, but, uh, but the pastor is the, is the lead, uh, among the elders, if you will. The pastor is an elder, but it would take the lead, whereas there's a, some sense from this passage that there is not necessarily a lead elder. Um, you know, when Paul was there, obviously he was the lead. When the Apostle John pastored the church in Ephesus, he was obviously the lead. But these guys would have been apostles as well as pastors, and so uh, there wouldn't have been any real question about uh, who was in charge in that thing. But anyway, this is where a lot of the Presbyterian Baptist types get their model of multiple eldership. Uh, notice there in verse 21, he says, I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. Uh, that phrase, they must repent and have faith, is a summary of the kind of preaching that Paul was doing in this place. And he's encouraging them to uh, do the same thing. You have a similar discussion in Acts chapter 26, where uh, it reads like this. First, to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and all Judea, and to the Gentiles also, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. So that's, Paul is saying, this is what I preach. Three things. I preach that they should repent, turn to God, and prove their repentance by their deeds. And this formulation in verse 21 of this chapter said, I preach repentance and faith in our Lord Jesus. So he's really saying the same thing there. He said, this is what my message is. This is an important idea. Uh, Charles Finney, when he was preaching in this, on this passage and in his basic teaching, said these are the three pillars of the gospel. That is, all of the gospel stands on these three ideas. That is repentance. That is, if you've sinned, you need to repent. That is, turn away from that sin, not continue in it. Uh, that you should turn to God. So it's not enough to say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, but you also need to turn to God. And in the passage before us, he said, have faith in Jesus. So it's not enough to say, I'm sorry for my sins. There has to be faith in Jesus Christ. That Jesus, I'm trusting you that when you died on the cross, you covered my sins. That's the other key idea. And then the third idea 
that's not so popular today, is that you prove your repentance by your deeds. That is, it cannot be a perpetual cycle of sin and repentance without any change of behavior. You know, at some point in time, I was, I was Wade Goodall back there, Dr. Wade Goodall. Uh, we were in a seminar one time. Well, actually, I was in the audience, and he was the, uh, on the panel. And all of these experts were giving a, a, a discussion about, and the question was asked, what would you say to a person who was involved in Ill- illicit sexual activity? And this was a conference for youth pastors, and so all the other experts give this long discussion about what they would say. And when Wade's turn came, he said, I would tell them to knock it off. <laughs> Uh, you know, that's what you call summarizing the truth uh, in short order. Just tell them to knock it off. Uh, and that, that was a good, you remember that, Wade? Uh, that was, he actually said that. And it was pretty funny at the time, too. It was still funny. Um, but anyway, but that's prove your repentance by your deeds. You know, if you're going to be a Christian, then act like it. I mean, be forgiven of your sins. And it's true that people are going to fail in particular areas, you know, whatever their particular weakness is. And so that's not to say that the second time you sin after having been forgiven, it's all over. Uh, That's not true. But on the other hand, not changing is not acceptable. You know, you need to say, God, help me here and help me to do different and to prove your repentance by your deeds. And so that was Paul's message. And uh, the great revival, uh, Charles Finney, if you don't know who he is, he was one of the great revivalists of American history and uh, in the 1800s and preached tremendous revivals, was very much responsible for the Christianizing of America in, after a, one of our dark times because we've had lots of ups and downs in this country. But, uh, and he, you know, he had these big meetings and he would give altar calls and thousands of people got saved. He was a powerful American evangelist. And, uh, but that was his message. Repent, turn to God, and prove that you've repented by how you live. Uh, and the three pillars of the gospel, according to his formulation and preaching. So it was uh, pretty awesome. Okay, now the next passage is a little difficult, and uh, we want to think about it, but I think there's some substance here. Verse 22, And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me, if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom, will ever see me again. He's still talking to the Ephesian elders. You'll never see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all of the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. Well, the difficult part of this passage is that Paul says, first of all, I'm never going to see you again. So he believed that he was going to be killed. 
And he said, everywhere I go, the Holy Spirit has warned me what's going to await me. That uh, prison and hardship are what await me in Jerusalem. That's what's going to happen. But he said, I feel compelled by the Holy Spirit to go. So think about this. You have people that say to him, uh, Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, there's going to be trouble. They're going to put you in prison. Uh, you know, they're going to you know, tie you with ropes and, uh, you know, it's going to be bad. And, uh, and Paul realizes that it's not only going to be bad, but they're going to kill him. In the end, the net result of all of this is they're going to kill him. Because, he says to them, I'll never see you again. So he clearly knows what the outcome of this is. And so the question is, if the Holy Spirit is telling Paul these bad things that are going to happen in Jerusalem, why doesn't Paul, as he did many other times, say, okay, if that's what they want to do to me, I'm going somewhere else. I mean, this journey that we started on here, in this chapter, uh, he is le he's leaving a particular place. And the reason he decides to leave Greece and go inland, whereas instead of going by ship, is he knew there was a plot to kill him. You know, I mean, there were these pilgrim ships that would leave. And he probably knew that he was going to get on a ship with a bunch of Jewish people, uh, some of whom would have been radicals. And they were probably going to rob him and then throw him overboard. You know, that's the kind of thing that he was expecting. And so he says, you know, I think uh, I'll just walk. Never mind. I don't need a ride. Uh, not, don't need to sail today. I'll just walk. You know, the hundreds of miles that it is. And so instead of sailing, you know, west, he heads north and walks all the way up through Greece, what's modern-day Greece, comes down around and comes down through Turkey, uh, modern-day Turkey, and goes a very long way. So if he does all of that, why is it that here, when he's getting close to Jerusalem, he still goes on ahead and goes there? Uh, why does he ignore it? Well, you know, in Paul's case, from the very moment he got saved, and he tells us about it a little bit in one of the passages there, that he says, you know, God showed me from the very beginning the things that I was going to suffer. He, I mean, from the day he got saved, he knew that he had a rough ride. And so he wasn't actually afraid of that. I mean, obviously, I mean, the old saying is, there's no education in the second kick of a mule. Uh, and so he did learn from uh, his experiences, you know, and so he, he didn't feel the need to, you know, to be, he wasn't a glutton for punishment. Uh, it wasn't some kind of masochist, you know, but, and so he was willing to avoid it. But, when he felt like the Lord was in it, uh, which he felt like the Lord wanted him to go to Jerusalem for Pentecost, um, then uh, he went uh, knowing what he was going to suffer. There's a couple of topics that I think come out of this for people like you and me. Uh, number one, in the course of your life, you are going to hear a lot of things from people who say they have a word from the Lord for you. I mean, I presume you're going to get that. I know that a pastor gets that a lot. Um, you know, there's people that give you words all the time. And as it turns out, they often give you contradictory words. That is, they aren't always the same. You know, one, you know it's one's this way and one's that way. And so what do you do with that? You know, do you say, oh, well, there's no such thing as prophetic words. And you say, oh, it's all hooey and malarkey. You know, what Paul said in Corinthians, he said, when someone prophesies, uh, others should judge what is said. So when someone says, thus says the Lord, thus and so, others are to judge what is said. And, and the, 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 when it says to judge what is said, he, it basically means to doubt it. To say to take a step back, and test it and see if you agree that that is the word of the Lord. Uh, and to evaluate it. And, and what you find is sometimes a person will give you a word from the Lord 
that, you know, there's 10% of it that's really good. And that 90% of it, you just say, well, you know, that person cares. And that's what they think. And so, you know, you give them the benefit of the doubt, obviously. But you've got to come to your own decisions about what God is saying. You listen to what anybody would say, but you judge it. You evaluate it. And you don't just, you know, go willy-nilly. That's why I'm not a fan, by the way, of private prophecy. You know, because Paul said others should judge. I don't know if it's still popular today, but, you know, 20 years ago, you had people that gave a lot of private prophecies. They'd want to come over to your house and prophesy to you this and that. And the problem with that is there's nobody there to judge. Nobody there to listen. You know, because you want other people to listen to the prophecy and, uh, and they can offer their judgment on it as well. You know, there's safety in having more than one person. Well, the Bible says there's wisdom in many counselors. But uh, judging prophecy uh, should always be evaluated. So here's Paul. He's getting these words. Don't go to Jerusalem because you're going to get put in prison. They're going to work you over and they're, they're probably going to kill you. And so Paul listens to that. And he said, boy, thank you for your concern there. But, you know, he said, I've prayed about this and I feel like God wants me to go. And even if I'm going to be, you know, have the daylights beat out of me when I get there, I feel like I should go because there's some people there that are going to need to hear uh, what I have to say. And so he is essentially willing to endure the pain. I was talking to a, a pastor last night who is going through, not here at the church, but elsewhere, who is going through a very difficult time. And, um, you know, and his church is being very hard on him. And, um, and, it's not, and it's painful for him. And so what do you do in a case like that? You know, I just basically said, you know what? If you're going to be in the ministry, you're going to get the daylights beat out of you from time to time. It's just what, what's going to happen to you. And, uh, and so you have to decide whether the call of God is greater and more important to you than the particular pain you might suffer at any given moment in time. Because nobody is getting through this thing scot-free, basically. And every minister takes a beating from time to time. You just, it just... It just goes with the territory. You know, anytime you're going to talk to a lot of people, there's going to be some people sitting out there with everything you say that thinks you're a complete idiot. You know, and worse than that, they're going to have malicious thoughts. And sometimes even, well, as some, one pastor said, you know what, what it is about, because here Paul said, you're the shepherd of the sheep. Do you know what it is about sheep? Sometimes they bite. And, uh, and that's true. You know, sometimes the sheep bite the shepherd. I, there's a funny thing I saw on Facebook where the shepherd was, had a bunch of goats and this, this billy goat just comes up and plasters him and lays him out on the ground. And then he starts to get up and he hits him again. You know, I mean, sometimes it's like that. But it's not just pastors. You know, I mean, that's life. You know, you're from time to time going to get the tweet beat out of you. Uh, and, it's gonna, and sometimes it's going to happen from people that you thought were your friends. Uh, that, you, that you thought were, and, and maybe they are your friends, um, but they can still pound on you pretty bad. And you have to be convinced in your own mind what it is that God is saying. Uh, and to hear the voice of God and to not listen to every voice that comes along. Because as well-intentioned as people might be, you give an account to God for your actions and your obedience to Him. You're not to everybody else. Now, uh, it's a very unwise person who ignores all, you know, advice from everybody. You know, that's a foolish person who never listens. But it's also a foolish person who does what everybody says they should do. You know, be convinced in your own mind what's right and do that in prayer. And I've always said, you know, in, in the way I've thought about you know, what I should do, uh, I would never take somebody's advice of what I should do uh, if the Lord hadn't already spoken to me about it. If the Lord had spoken to me about it and someone comes along with a confirmation, I'm good with that. But someone just kind of taken my life because, you know, most everybody you meet has a wonderful plan for your life. You know, they have a lot of things they want you to do. 
Uh, but, you know, we answer to the Lord, right? And, uh, and so he should direct us. And it's one of the things that you have to be kind of grown up about in the spiritual life is that you don't listen to every voice. I mean, you listen to it, but you do what Paul says. You evaluate it. You judge it. Uh, and and I, in the notes there, I have the, I, I quoted actually from one of the um, commentaries, uh, and uh, I don't know where it is in there, um, but um, it's in there somewhere if you want to read it, what it means to judge uh, words that are spoken, to evaluate and uh, almost to reflexively step back from what is said there. And just because someone says, thus says the Lord, um, well, it's like eating a fish. You eat the meat, you spit out the bones. You know, there's probably something that can be learned by everybody that speaks to you. Um, and maybe the lesson is don't listen to people like that. But, uh, but you, you can probably learn something from everybody that talks. And, uh, but there's also stuff that you're going to want to ignore in almost everybody that talks. So you're accountable to God yourself, not for somebody else. And so Paul comes to that conclusion and um, and, and proceeds on, and it happens exactly the way everybody said. Uh, Paul did take a beating, and in the end, they killed him. I mean, he went through a circuitous journey and ended up in Rome, you know, but he was able to testify before kings and rulers the very things that God said he was going to do, and in the end, they killed him. Uh, and Paul knew that's what was going to happen, and he pressed ahead anyway because he was more concerned about the mission than he was, well, about the money and also about the outcome. He knew he had to be faithful. And that's what you have to be is faithful and to carry on in that way and let God be in charge of the outcome. I don't know if I got any more pictures here or not. Uh, that will do that one. That will do that one next week. Okay, well, uh, we've got a little bit of time for Q&A or comments. If you would like to make comments, and I will give my phone number for those that are watching online in case you would want to uh, text me a question. My phone number is 425-770-5220, and uh, you're welcome to, uh, I'm not on Facebook, I am on Facebook at the moment, but I'm uh, not monitoring it, so only by phone number, 425-770-5220. If you want to text me a, mess, a question or a comment, and, um, or here in the uh, chapel, you have a question or comment, you're welcome to, uh, to do that. Ask a question or make a comment. Anybody? Well, you're a lively bunch. Yes, sir. Well, you mean Clement of Alexandria? Yeah, I mean, he does talk quite a bit about um, church life. I mean, he was head of the um, Alexandrian school of theology there in, the, uh, in his era, fourth century. Um, and he's a very influential person. But in terms of the actual content of uh, services, the way we think about services, uh, I don't recall anything in Clement's writings on that subject. Yeah, I mean, it might be, but I, I certainly don't require it, recall it. I haven't read it for 15 years, but, um, but I, I, having, you know, I've, I've read through all of the church fathers, every single one of them cover to cover. And it, one of the topics that I was interested in was this topic, you know, and so I, I didn't make any notes uh, on that subject from any of those readings. Yes. Well, an elder, uh, the question was, what's the difference between an elder and a, a deacon? Um, in the ancient church, it was um, a stage. Most deacons were on the pathway to eldership in the ancient church. So it's kind of like an, just like we said, you start out with license, then you become ordained. Uh, deacons in those earliest days were going to be you know, elders at one point in time. But they were, a, a, a deacon is called a, a servant of the church. In Acts chapter 6, they are people full of the Holy Spirit, who uh, men who are full of the Holy Spirit who waited tables, essentially. 
That was their duties. But some of those became great preachers uh, in time. And it was the pathway. You know, the words for elders, there's different words. Presbyteros, that's where the Presbyterians, you know, the presbytery, that's an elder. Episcopos, that's where the Episcopalians get their name uh, from the Episcopos. Those are interchangeable names for elders. Um, and so um, they tend to be, uh, we would call them bishops today or superintendents or pastors uh, as being elders. And, uh, and here in this church, we would even call deacons elders. I mean, they have the function of an elder. But, um, but we don't call them elders in our system as a general rule. And so it was basically uh, almost like a level. But in the beginning, they thought every deacon would become uh, a presbyter. They would become a, uh, eventually were on the way toward, you know, kind of full leadership in a church. Well, there was a debate in the church during that period of time. In fact, the reason they went to the Jerusalem, you know, Paul was up in Antioch. And, and Peter uh, would ultimately be the bishop of Antioch. They, you know, the Catholics say he's the bishop of Rome, but in fact, he was the bishop of Antioch, first leader there. But Peter was one who was actually kind of uh, teaching some of the law kind of stuff and did so up in Galatia as well. Uh, and Paul said, you know, I had to withstand him to his face because he was wrong about this. And so Paul said, but we, but we need to have an authoritative decision on this. And that's why, so well, let's take it to the uh, elders, uh, James, who was head of the church in Jerusalem, and the, and the others that were there. They have the Jerusalem council. They discuss it. Uh, and James at the end says, it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us that this is the decision, and spread the word. Now, what year would Acts 15 be? Uh, does anybody know exactly? I'm thinking it's like 20 years, um, uh, or maybe 18 years in that length of time. Um, anybody know for sure? Uh, I don't. It may be some, well, anyway. But it's, it's that roughly that period of time. So um, uh, there, there was uh, uncertainty about that. And there were debates about it, but that's the decisive moment where it is settled uh, in the church. So 20 years after the resurrection, I would say it was a settled matter. Yeah. So if it's if it's a total of thirty years, and um, and from from Paul's time, so that would make it maybe fifty five, sixty, A.D. Yeah, it could be twenty five or thirty years. So yeah, I, I I mean, in the margin of certain Bibles that I have, I can see that date, but it doesn't come back to me right now. So. It's always good to have a Bible that gives you the timelines and the margins. When I first started out, I always used Dake's commentary on the Bible. I kept that Bible by my desk in case somebody would call and ask these kinds of questions because you could find almost anything very quickly in Dake's annotated commentary on the Bible. And so I, you know, that was because I didn't go to Bible school. And when I first started out in the ministry, I thought, man, everybody else knows a great deal more about the Bible than I do. Uh, and so... I studied like crazy for many decades, you know, to try to catch up. But, uh, but I always kept, I literally kept that Bible next to my phone because I was sure somebody from here was going to call and ask me some obscure Bible question. And back then I thought, you know, you had to have the answer to that. Now I just say, I, I don't know. <laughs> or I make something up, you know, and that, uh, that, that 
that fools most of the people. But anyway, yeah, that's the honest truth. I was doing a radio program one time when I was first in the ministry, and it was a call-in program. This was down in Salem, Oregon. And, um, um, and, and one of the yahoos that was t- trying to get me uh, calls up and says, and what is the meaning of the Urim and the Thummim in the Bible? You know, I mean, you think, oh, you jerk, you know. I mean, but I figured out who it was, and so I, I don't know if I got even with him, but I definitely should have. Uh, but it was kind of like stump the guy who's on the radio right now, trying to be a smart aleck. So anybody else with a comment or question that you'd like to ask? Um, here's one. Um, what did you mean by the transition? Did the early church continue practicing the Sabbath as well as the Lord's Day? I'm not sure who sent this. They don't have their name on it. And, um, but anyway, um, maybe it's somebody in here. Did somebody ask that question? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, the transition. So in the early um, church, I mean, they're all, these are Jewish people. They're all Jewish. And Luke is, is basically telling us of the transition um, from purely Judaism uh, to uh, including the Gentiles. That would be one of the narratives of the expansion of the church. So Acts 2, all uh, Jews who received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Acts um, at chapter 10, or Acts chapter 8, half Jews, half Gentile, the Samaritans. Acts chapter 10, all Gentile. Uh, Acts 19, uh, the Ephesians, in that case, uh, presumably Gentiles. And so uh, he's, he's giving us that transition. And Acts 15 fits that overall narrative because uh, what was necessary to salvation? I mean, there, would, there were people saying, you know, everybody needs to keep the Jewish law because that's what we have to do. That's what they should have to do. That's just how this thing works. Um, and they said, no, that's not what God's uh, plan was. You know, what Paul says that uh, the law, uh, the end of the law, the telos of the law, that is the outcome of the law is Christ. And that salvation through Christ is the meaning of the law. And so, you know, we've spent a lot of energy and study of the law in order to see what it says about Christ. And Paul in the same area says that the law is a schoolmaster which leads us to Christ. So if the law leads us to Christ, we don't go back to the law as the means of salvation. And so because it was a, pre- it was a preparation for understanding Christ and what his sacrifice on the cross meant and the substitution of blood uh, for the one who is guilty and all these kinds of ideas. So... Uh, that period of time when kind of both voices are being heard in the church and people are trying to figure it out. And so the Acts 15 Council is essentially uh, the fulfillment of what we'd call binding and loosing that Jesus talked about in Matthew 16 where he says to the church, you know, the authority, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. And, uh, and the meaning of that is certain things the law says, if you, you bind it, you have to do it. If you're loosed, you don't have to do that. And so Jesus gave that authority, transferred it in Matthew 16 from the Sanhedrin uh, to his disciples and invested in them the spiritual authority. And so then in Acts 15, they uh, exercised that authority. And, uh, and come to the final decision, if you will, about, uh, about the law and what was required of believers to keep the law and to what extent. And that's what makes this passage in Acts 20 interesting because the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, you know, Passover, although Passover is not mentioned, uh, those are elements of the law. And yet Paul has an interest in continuing to observe those, even in Acts chapter 20. And so that informs us somehow uh, that we should want to benefit. And in my life and ministry, I've tried to bring those elements forward as, uh, as teaching the ways of Christ. So you study the Old Testament in order, to, well, someone has said, the New Testament 
is in the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. That is, they're going from one to the other. And so you should be able to study the Old Testament and understand what Christ did. And the reason you should be able to do that, because Christ actually gave that sermon, as reported in Luke's gospel, that he actually you know, opened up the scriptures, you know, the law of Moses and all the way through, and showed them all that it said about him. So Christ is all through the Old Testament, uh, but you have to um, discern it and uh, kind of figure it out. And that's the great, that's why the Bible is limitless. You know, you can study it forever and not, you know, learn all there is to know on the subject. Okay, maybe time for one or two more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but the Lord's Day was not the Sabbath. Yeah. Well, those that were Jewish probably were. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, and these, of course, are not necessarily Jewish people. You know, uh, they may have been some Jewish people among them, but the names don't read like Jewish names. Um, and so um, they probably weren't. But, you know, um, you know, even though we don't regard, like, the rules against not working on the Sabbath as a matter of legal uh, requirement, you know, in, the, in America, it used to be that nothing was open on Sunday. Nothing. You couldn't go to a restaurant. There were no stores that were open on Sunday. Everything was closed on Sunday because it was the Lord's Day, and you applied the concepts of the Sabbath to the Lord's Day. And in fact, they, they, they had, uh, I don't know what it was in Washington, but in Oregon, I know, there were the, what they called the blue laws. And literally, if you went to someone and tried to collect a debt on Sunday, the debt was no longer owed. That was the law of the state of Oregon back in the day. The blue laws. I mean, I don't think they exist anywhere in the country anymore, but it used to be that way. I remember, for example, when Fred Myers opened their doors for the first time on a Sunday. I remember that. Um, you know, Fred Myers would not have been open on a Sunday. And that was probably in the, in the mid-1960s. You know, we used to be a very different country than we are today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, a lot closer, because it's the Sabbath. And there's a great deal that's not open on the Sabbath day. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Well, Google it, Blue Laws, and just read about it, because it is interesting to tell you. It gives you an idea of what America once was like. But I didn't know they were still in existence anywhere. But yeah, yeah. 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 Well, the mission was, and pleasing Christ was more important than anything else, which it ought to be to us. You know, uh, maybe just as a final thought here, you think about how much Paul traveled, and not in a cruise ship, how much he traveled, how hard he worked, what he was willing to endure in order that somebody would be saved. And I'd just like to ask you how much your life reflects that idea. Like how far are you willing to go to see somebody saved? So for example, are you still praying for the members of your family to be saved? I mean, brothers and sisters, parents and kids, that would be a start. Do you look for opportunities in the connections that you have? Everybody has some connection. I mean, if it's the, the postman or the postperson or whatever that is, or, um, you know, the clerk in the store, 
Um, or I don't know, can't do that online, I guess. But uh, I mean, but everybody has somebody, right? And so it ought to be a matter of a desire for them to be saved. And how much trouble are you willing to go to in order for somebody to be saved? I mean, are you willing to go out of your way a distance? Are you willing to put up with any guff in order for the, uh, for the word to come to somebody? Um, I mean, this, you, you, you can kind of measure yourself against someone like Paul. Of course, when you do, every one of us feel pretty small. You know, like, what have I ever done for the Lord, you know, when you consider what he did? Um, but, I mean, I don't, I don't, you don't need to be uptight about that. But you do need to ask yourself, you know, what you're doing to encourage somebody to be saved. In your family, in your circle, in your wider world. I mean, certainly, you know, trying to build a church and supporting a church, that's part of it. But, you know, don't let the church do all the salvation business. You know, do a little bit of that of your own self, you know, and, and through prayer and, and discussion. And I mean, whatever the opportunity comes up, you look for an opportunity. Try to make an opportunity to uh, encourage somebody toward faith in Jesus Christ. I mean, it can be a plate of cookies, you know, and a cup of Jesus had a cup of cold water given in his name would have its reward, you know. And so the smallest of things done in Jesus' name um, is something which God looks for. And he looks for that in all of us. So uh, we need to, to measure up as good as we can. Do our best to serve the Lord. Okay, well, it is that time within a matter of seconds. And uh, so we'll be done. So thanks for you that joined us online, and thanks for you that braved the sunshine to come out um, to uh, the church on, uh, and fill up this chapel. Nice to see you all here. And uh, so, you know, gre greet these folks that are new tonight and uh, make sure they feel like it's okay for them to come back. And uh, we'll be back, God willing, next Wednesday night and go after it again. Let's uh, stand together and have a word of prayer. Praise God. Lord, I thank you for building the church. Uh, and that you use us all to have a, a part in that work. Thank you, Lord, that you called us to salvation. Forgive us, Lord, that we've so often fallen short by the wrong choices that we've made and also by the failure to do the things that are good and right and that could make a difference in someone's life. Lord, forgive us of that, but help us to prove our repentance by our deeds. Uh, that to do things differently going forward uh, in the opportunities that you give to us. I pray, Lord, that your peace would be upon each life here today, upon each relationship. Uh, help us to serve you uh, tonight and tomorrow and to give every day to you. So we commit ourselves to you now in Christ's wonderful name. Amen.